Jason Waller. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome to the circle. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> happy to have you. Uh, for those people who need more of an introduction, um, actor, uh, professional host, TV personality, um, sobriety advocate, uh, you seem to be doing it all at such a young age. Um, probably most of the world knows you as the hottie bad boy from the MTV Laguna Beach show. Yeah, there was some history there, but I, I have lived uh, a lot of lives at a very <laughs> young age. That is very true. Of course, I know you as the best friend, my nephew, Cedric, growing yes. up in Laguna Beach, um, who also appeared on the show. Yes. Um, you were like a son to uh, his parents, Cedric and Micheline. I mean, they just love you to death. And uh, so very I- Very near and dear to me. I love them very much. I mean, I, I think I spent more time at their house uh, than I did my own. Well, my son, Arist, is best friends with Cedric's little brother, Nick, and he did too. So yeah, it <laughs> goes around and common, everybody sure. wanted to be there. Yes. Yeah. Um, you not only uh, appeared on MTV's Laguna Beach, but you are also the, one of the stars of The Hills. Yes. Which is currently up and running. Yes, Just it started rebooted. its new season. Yes, it rebooted it and it's actually on right now on Wednesdays at nine o'clock. So awesome, awesome. It's going good. Um, I didn't know this, but apparently you were also on a show, Celebrity Rap Superstar. Yeah, we don't like to talk about that <laughs> one. Oh, that was I, you know, back in the day. Well, you kind of had a pretty uh pretty famous co-host there. So um Kevin Hart, yeah. Kevin Hart. Great guy. My kids love Kevin Hart. He's a good dude. People are obsessed with him. Um, and you also appeared on Dr. Drew's Celebrity Rehab. Yep. And made, my, made my rounds, you know. I <laughs> Was on Laguna Beach, the hills, and had to end up in treatment. You know how that goes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and since getting sober, you have dedicated your life to raising awareness towards addiction with the hopes of one day changing the public's negative opinion or ne negative perception on this deadly disease, which no greater work could be done for sure. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's something that I hold, you know, very near and dear to my heart. This is something that has not only impacted my life personally, but my whole family's life. Um, and, you know, it's there's obviously so many people out there that are struggling today. And it's the only disease uh, in American history that's been on a steady incline of the amount of deaths with a steady decline with the amount of success rate. So it's oh very fascinating if you look at it. I mean, the amount of people that are dying from this, it's in your, it just not more is being contributed or, or done about it. It's very, very, very frustrating. Yeah, I know. And it's impacted everybody. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to go into more, more of that, but let's first start out at the top. Let's start recent and go work your way back. So tell me okay. about, uh, tell me about the Hills and I know your beautiful wife, Ashley is on it with you. Yes. How, how, what's that like? It is a, uh, it's totally different than when I used to do it. Um, okay. You know, being somebody that is sober and being a family man and, and, you know, going on with your wife, it's a, it's a totally different uh, experience this time around than it was last uh, but it's fun. I mean, it's it's for the you know the real reason why my wife and I are on the show this go around is to to really spread hope. Um, and it was an opportunity for us to show and share what we had walked through, share our experience, strength, and hope uh, for so many people out there that struggle and are going through the same thing, or have somebody that they love that is going through that. Yeah. Uh, so it was an opportunity for us, and we felt comfortable uh, to share our experience. And so it was something that was very special. But it's it's definitely a it's an interesting process going through this. I mean, especially when you're, you have to remember when I was on Laguna Beach or the Hills back in the day, I was back in 2005 and I was 17, 18 years old going into this and uh, had no idea what to expect. Right. Um, you know, and and the shows, I mean, the, the show that Cedric and I are on and, and you know, Kristen and Lauren and everybody else, the Laguna Beach show, it was, it was a phenomenon. Overnight, yeah. it became an instant success and it revolutionized the way TV was done. It really did. That's what created a lot of different shows. And so it's it's really cool to to be a part of that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very grateful to have had that experience, especially since uh, I originally never wanted to be on the show back when I was in high school. Right. Um, I was actually uh, convinced by my parents, of all people, and a couple of friends, hey, it'd be cool to have your senior year documented. Uh, and little did they know it'd become the biggest nightmare. But uh, it also has worked. There's also been the you know, the the benefits from it. And it's allowed me to to be at where I'm at today. And yeah. it's cool to have the Jason that I was in high school and struggling with addiction, mental health and substance abuse, to have the show resurface and being a person now that has totally transformed his life, um, you know, and, and to show people that you can do it. 
Well, for those people that don't know, so The Hills was a spinoff from the Laguna Beach show. So it's it's basically the same people who were on Laguna Beach that are now on The Hills. So how many of those people did you actually keep in contact well, with? So, so Laguna Beach was, it, that all took place after the show, The OC, uh, like the scripted show on Fox. Right. And it was more of, okay, let's do a really reality-based show around this you know soft docuseries. And um, that show, so the, the cast from that, we were all friends in high school. We really were. And the spinoff of The Hills was actually around Lauren. Uh, it was supposed to be like the Sex in the City version of the younger demographic of females. So her and some of her friends that were not on Laguna went up to LA and kind of did the Sex in the City type theme. Right. Um, and a few of us from Laguna came on the show uh, and then it that just continued and it did very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So isn't it funny though? I mean, isn't it kind of like, like a high school reunion where you're going back and you're like, I don't even it, know if I still, if these people are still a bit, you're it, hanging out together now. It is. Well, it's funny. I, I really wish I would have loved to have done a Laguna Beach show as yeah. opposed to The Hills because the right. Laguna Beach show, I was a lot more, I was, those are still some of my friends that I yeah. talked to today yeah. versus The Hills, especially that's what was the trippiest thing going back on this show, The Hills, because they, they weren't my high school friends. I mean, there was a couple people that I've known through the process, but going back and seeing them, especially in this, the sober Jason versus who I was before, it was like mm. me meeting these people for the first time all over again. Oh, I see. So it was okay. a totally different perspective. So, I mean, we literally didn't stay in touch after 10 years. I'd come into contact with a couple of them. We'd you know, cross paths, say hello, but we really went our own ways after the show was done. So share a little bit about, because I lived in Laguna Beach, obviously, as well. Yeah. Um, that show was so impactful. Um, I remember, I think the, the statistics were that our tourism in that city went up 30% um, after the show. I mean, you couldn't drive down the street in Laguna during would, the summer months anymore. I would argue that it was more than that. It, it, possibly, yeah. I mean, who knows? That's probably old figures. But um what what was that like for you? I mean, was it just overnight you were a celebrity and Yeah, I'll never forget. Um, you know, again, as I grew up playing baseball my whole life and you know, I was wanted to go play college baseball and uh that was the direction I was going. But after doing this show, um I remember, you know, they the MTV said they're gonna start running ads and they're gonna start putting stuff, you know, in movie theaters, you know, the commercials are gonna start airing. And as soon as that happened, uh I remember the next day when everything started to come out, I went down to the gas station and my car got swarmed uh, with people. And uh, it was a very, very, at 17 years old, you don't know how to respond to that type of stuff. Obviously young and, you know, you know, still trying to figure out life, you know, it, it feed it an ego. Uh, you know, it's anybody wants to be loved and liked. And uh, overnight, everything literally had changed. Yeah. Overnight. I remember we were up in San Francisco and I was with the boys and we had to do something where we showed our IDs and the girl goes, Channels, are, are you related to Cedric Channels? And we're like, are you kidding me right now? Right. We're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was like, oh my gosh, that's it's my favorite. Well, it's just, it's crazy yeah. to look at, you know, the, the time frame. I mean, back then that was, there was no YouTube. Yeah. There was no, you know, social media like it like there is today. I mean, there was maybe MySpace or something, but there was right. no other outlet. So, I mean, cable, the TV was was your way to, you know, produce shows and, and create products and, and and have that versus what we have today. So that's another interesting experience is, is it's totally different now being back on the show and stuff versus what it was, you know, 15 years ago. It's a, it's a not only the shooting experience, but just the aftermath and everything that goes along with it is it's it's not the same as it was 15 years ago. And for me, I, it's it's better. I like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, well, and I think overall as a society, we've gotten so much more used to the reality um, series. I mean, it, you right. guys really launched. You guys were the genesis of that that thing. So now it's a little bit more, you know, more prevalent. But I got to tell you, do, do you still have your yearbook? I do. Because I heard that they were going for like $10,000 on eBay. Were they really? Yeah. Did you not hear that? Did not hear that. Good, because you probably would have been like, you know yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. I, got a, I actually have a few. Yearbook, uh, schmearbook. Yeah. That's so funny. I had no idea. Yeah. What a trip. Yeah. But I do. I, I had a mother that really uh, loved making sure she kept everything. So, I mean, I literally have bins of stuff that like from... I mean, there was merchandise, like they had books, they had calendars, they had, I mean, clothes. I mean, you name it. They yeah. they had, it was everywhere. Uh, <laughs> the shirts and the concepts that they made up were were crazy. I didn't realize how big of a franchise, especially when you're in it and you're young, you're not really yeah. paying attention to that. Yeah. But looking back, I'm grateful my mom, <clears throat> you know, had collected all this stuff and 
because it just seeing like what we were really a par- part of, it was yeah. it was pretty incredible. Makes for a cool memory box. It does. Definitely does be able to explain to my kids later on, you know, yeah. what, <laughs> what this was all about. So they say that money and fame don't change who you are. They amplify it. Um, do you think, obviously coming out of that, there was a lot of people saying MTV was encouraging these kids to drink. They wanted the drama. How big of an impact did the show have on your eventual abuse of substance? Look, the show did not cause my addiction. I mean, I'm one of those uh, individuals who's pre-genetically disposed. So 20% of all people that struggle with addiction are pre-genetically disposed. The other 80% are affected by the environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, The statistics may have changed a little bit, but that's from the last I remember looking at it. That's really what it was. Um, so you, like going, looking at the show for myself, I already had the addiction issues. Mm-hmm. It just basically added fuel to the fire. And you basically, I always said, you know, at that age, I mean, I had an overinflated ego with an underestimated sense of self-worth. And basically I was validating everything on the outside, you know, of what people saw is who I really am. But internally, I never really felt that way. Um, so I, I, I was struggling even prior to picking up a drink or a drug. Um, I really struggled, and I can look back now after doing so much work and 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 so spending so much time looking at my myself. Uh, you know, I can really look back at like 13, 14 years old again before I ever picked up a drink or a drug that I really, really struggled uh, with insecurities, with you know, just self shaming, um, you just never feeling adequate or never feeling good enough. Um, and you know, and as I got a little bit older and I started to get in, in, in engage and, and start to drink and experience with, experience with drugs a lot of those feelings and emotions uh, went away. And so obviously something that I was trying to... Masked it. Masked it. Well, but also you have to keep in mind back in 2003, 2004, we did not have the outlets or the resources. My parents did everything they possibly could. And, you know, I came from a very, very structured, very good morals, values, family, parents today who are still married, coming up on 49 years of marriage. Uh, You know, so I had that structure and that stability and stuff in there and they tried everything they possibly could. But uh, they, there was... I didn't know how to express what I was going through. Right. Um, and again, it was not, it wasn't talked about like it is today. Right, right, right. And if and that's, uh, I think one of the big things is if you don't share or talk about or connect with other individuals, how do you know that others are going through it? And how do you know where there's going to be success? And that goes back to why we're doing this show, you know, and why we're back on the hills is trying to really mitigate that stigma associated with it. Because I mean, I, there are so many resources today that people should be aware of. And there's so much, there's there's so many things you can do to better yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you don't have to go through what we experienced, you know, back in the day, because there's so many people that are in that still. Right. Well, and, and you touch on, a, on an interesting point because so many people believe that if you grew up with any issues, it must be because you come from a dysfunctional family. You know, if you you must have had some adverse childhood experiences that that created this in you. And, and you're you really said you came from a great family. You lived in a beautiful neighborhood. I mean, you didn't want for much. And I can imagine that that almost must have been a, another level of guilt, right? It was. It, it, it really was. And that's the thing is because a lot of people, and to, to answer your question, there are a lot of people that do have issues that come from dysfunction, but I'm also a proof to show you that that is not the case too. Right. People, there can be dysfunction within your own self even though you have a, a tight knit container around you and, and having good leaders and good mentors. And, um, you know, I had a struggle that, that, uh, that did not come from a dysfunction though, for my family. It was, it was something that was internal. Do you think that there's anything, I mean, looking back now and knowing what you know about addiction, do you, is there anything that you could have done differently or somebody could have done to, to help you back then? I think it's just, I, I wish I was able to be more open uh, and to talk more honestly about what I was really going through. I'd always, you know, because when you're 13, 14, you're just trying to play the cool, I'm, I'm okay, yeah, you know, everything's surface fine. level, but really kind of dive into what I was really experiencing, you know, and, and those those negative thoughts that I thought about myself. Just, uh, I wish I had a, a safe place to talk about that where there was not going to be judgment, shame, or uh, guilt associated with it. And I mean, there are those things today. And I think that's, again, goes to anybody that is struggling is being able to reach out and connect and talk with somebody about it is very healing. You know, not one of the, the longest living studies around happiness uh, is is through human connection. And that's a study that's been done at Harvard. And it's something that is so true. 
It is so true, especially looking at the pandemic and everything that we've gone through through isolation. No wonder suicide overdoses and so many things are at such a high rate because we've taken away from what robs us of, the, of our, our happiest moments. And that's when I look back when I was young, it was just being able to, I had connection and I had all those things, but it was not at a level that was satisfying to what I was going through. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know, and I, I have a bit similar experience. I think, you know, both of my kids, um, I've got boys in their 20s grew, that grew up in Laguna Beach and, you know, have described similar things in their childhood that I wasn't aware of, you know, like times when they just felt super insecure. And, you know, as a parent now, I look back and go, you know, what could I have done differently? Or, you know, how could I be more, um, more aware and a better parent? And so sharing those types of things, I think it's, it all comes back down to communication, right? It does. Well, can I ask you a question? Flip yeah. the script is after experiencing that with your children. I mean, is there things that you would have done differently? Because I mean, you're very involved with their lives. I mean, yeah. is there something that you would have done differently? Um, I think maybe I would have had deeper conversations. I think my feeling was because I because I came from a very hard background of a mom that was a drug addict and alcoholic in and out of foster homes. I, you know, chose Laguna Beach to raise my kids. And even though um, I separated from their dad when they were, I think, six and eight, um, we thought we're just going to leave them here because it's such a beautiful place to raise children. We just thought, you know. And so when they would come up with issues, I discounted them. I was like, please, you live in Laguna. These, These problems are not problems. Maybe I should have taken them a little bit more seriously and dug a little bit deeper. I think it wasn't until... I started actually seeing the evidence, um, the drug use, the the you know issues that started coming out in their teen years. That I started going, where is this coming from? I mean, you know. But well, reading think, your story, I, I I I remember a lot of that. Well, I think it, and I totally respect that, and I appreciate that. But I think it's also look at what you're doing right now. Yeah. This is this is how you make a change, and this yeah. is it's the communication and talking about it. There there is no right or wrong from it, right? It's yeah. it's we're still trying to discover this. It's such a multifaceted thing: mental health, substance abuse. Um, there is no there is no cookie cutter fix to this. Right. It's and it's constantly evolving. That's the thing is that our society is getting more fast paced. We can't even keep up with it. Yeah, and that's but so I, again, as I applaud you for talking about it and opening up about it, especially not only from the addict side, but I the, the biggest thing is having other individuals, I call you guys normies, people that don't struggle with substance abuse mm-hmm. or other things like that, but it's getting... I'm a normie? Like, yeah, you're a normie. <laughs> Do whatever that means, right? But having the conversation around it, I think that's one of the most important things is yeah. we as alcoholics and addicts understand what we're going through, but we need the other side to understand what that is. And then there's a, there's a whole nother story that I could talk to you about with, with that is because the codependence and, and, and uh, the enablers or sometimes just as sick, if not sicker, yeah. uh, than the alcoholics or addicts. But that's that's a whole other conversation. But what we're doing today, talking about this, is is incredible. Yeah, no, I I, I so agree. Um, so let's talk. So then you went on the Dr. Drew show. Yep. And I, as I understand it, you did that as much for support of your sobriety, but also to kind of like try to clear your name. Um, yes. Because your reputation was a little stained after yes. some of your partying days. Um, so what was that like to work with Dr. Drew? Dr. Drew, it, it was incredible. You know, he is one of the most intelligent and intellectual individuals when it comes to addiction and just how, how the brain works and how it operates. Um, he's, he's just so knowledgeable, but he's also very relatable. It's incredible how connected I felt with him. I mean, he was kind of one of the really big turning points because back when I went into celebrity rehab, July 23rd, 2010, which was my original sobriety date, um, you know, there was something that really shifted. There was a couple of moments of clarities that I had had, but also connecting with him and and Bob Forrest, who was his -hmm. his right-hand man, you know, there was something that really helped me transition and propel into a a positive light of, of sobriety that I never experienced before because you bring up the wreckage of my past. I mean, I'm a person that was arrested multiple times, went to 12 different treatment centers from Florida to Hawaii, every single state in between. Uh, and that was from the ages of 18 to 23 years old. It, you know, just there was a lot that happened in five years. I honestly don't even remember a lot of it. Um, but being able to have that connection with him, uh, there was a sense of respect, uh, but also a sense of uh, guidance and direction and willingness that came from me that he brought to me. I actually saw that show and I don't watch a lot of television and I'm not even quite sure why, I, but I watched that whole season. It was such a great season. And the interesting thing about it was how big of a support system the people inside the the group are, right? Because you guys have to like support each other. And, and I think a lot of people really look to you because you just, you know, even though you had gone through a lot to look at you sober, 
you just look like this fresh faced, gorgeous kid from Laguna Beach. Like, and I think people gravitated to your, to your like innocence or your, your freshness. And, um, did you, that. did you con- continue to keep those friendships over those? Yeah. Years? I still talk to a lot of the people yeah. <clears throat> that I was on the show with, you know, unfortunately when I'm, when my, my, actually my roommate uh, on the show, Jason passed away, um, this, this last year, a uh, year and a half ago now, um, you know, but the, a good chunk of the cast, I still stay in touch with. It's awesome. Drew still has reunion stuff that we all do together. And, and we just did one like a couple months ago, three months ago. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it, that whole show was, it was a great experience. I mean, I really went in there to change the negative, you know, the, the public's ne- negative perception on me. I mean, thanks to Us Weekly and the TMZs and all these different things, all that stuff I was going through. Thank God there was not social media, right. but all that stuff I was going through, obviously, you know, it's, uh, the, the public was able to paint a, paint a, a picture of who I was and what I was, what I looked like. And that just wasn't true. I mean, yes, that, that was true when I was under the influence, but I was also a very sick individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, and knowing what we know today, I'm not asking. For, I'm not saying that I'm justifying my behaviors. Take full ownership and accountability, but also understand that there is no such thing as recreational use of of heroin, of meth, of drinking a bottle of vodka a day. Imagine what somebody's really going through just to get through the day yeah. uh, when they're in that state of mind. So it's just changing the perception of it. Again, we don't have to like what the person's doing, but also just try to imagine what that person's going through. Right, right, right. And you know, I. Maybe it's just the perception, but it seems like there's a very close correlation between the entertainment business and addiction. Is, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, yes. I, for and I can see where you're coming from from that, and I think yeah, there 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 is, and there's also a lot of recovery in the entertainment business. Um, but I also just it, being working in the field and being in the space for so many years, obviously the disease does not discriminate, and it, it impacts all walks of life. Uh, Maybe we just see the ones in the entertainment business more. It's, they're yeah. more highlighted yeah. with that because a lot of people keep it keep it under wraps. You know, they don't, it, it's very shame-based um, and they don't want to talk about what it is that they're going through because they feel like they're going to be judged. And uh, again, that's where, that's where we got to change the narrative. Yeah. Got to change the narrative. Is there like, is there like a litmus test, you know, because I've heard people go, I could be an alcoholic. I mean, is there like a thing that says, if this is what's happening, you can, because you hear a lot of people too, that you look at them and you think, okay, you drink a lot and you drink every day, but their thing would be like, I, I, I gotta, I'm holding down my job. I'm doing what I need to do. It's not a problem. No, there is there is actually a few different resources that you can take just very quick tests, yes or no answers that can determine if you oh, if okay. you may struggle with addiction. I'd be more than happy to share those with you. If people, okay. Yeah, you might have some cool links to refer us to. Yeah, I definitely will. I like that you bring that up though, is because people, you know, will always justify if if there's not an issue or not. And I think I'd like to frame the question differently for people that struggle. Instead of saying, like, are you an alcoholic? I like to say, is alcohol adding or taking away from this beautiful life you have to live? Mm. And I think that's if you look at look at it that way, uh, you know, it can really change the perspective of the way you yeah. are looking at it. You know, as opposed to, are you an alcoholic? It's just more of like, is it adding or taking away? And oftentimes when you look at it differently and you have a softer approach with it, it makes you really realize like, man, maybe I maybe I am overdoing it. You know, and, and again, just starting the process of thinking about it as opposed to, oh, I just got to stop right this second is, is really reevaluating is even contributing to your life. Yeah. And that, when I've talked to people that way. Taking judgment out of it. Taking judgment out of it, yeah. you know, and and stop just again associating it with such negative negativity, as opposed to like, is this really even benefiting? Yeah, no, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So now, did you go to work with Dr. Drew, or how how did you go from being on the show to now being a sobriety advocate? What was that? Course like? No, so Dr. Drew was somebody again. Is after I came out of treatment, I you know, growing up, my whole my my responsibilities was like play baseball, get decent grades, like you got you kind of you know, you do what you need to do. And after the show came out, obviously didn't end up going to college, didn't pursue baseball um, and went and lived this entertainment life. And part of getting out of, you know, what I learned through treatment and stuff like that <clears throat> and going through celebrity rehab and, um, and and learning from my mentors is, you know, they, they created this willingness in me. They created this, uh, they, they had taught me to, to seek uh, some form of passion and motivation, something that would get me going again. And uh, so when I basically got out of celebrity rehab, it was more of like, hey, look, you need to like go get a job. You need to, you know, you need to, you, you know, you need to build a support system. You got to build a program. 
And um, one of those things, so I'd say one of the biggest attributions to my sobriety was acquiring a job. And so Dr. Drew was more of a mentor. I didn't really go work with him. I didn't work with him right after. It was more of, I only had, I went into celebrity rehab sober. So I actually was in treatment prior to the show coming on. And then I went into celebrity rehab. We had about like 90 to 120 days of sobriety at that time. And uh, Dr. Drew and Bob and, you know, some other people said, look, dude, you, you know, let's continue this. Uh, I was in a place of, like I said, willingness and I took direction and I ended up getting my first real job uh, at Northbound Treatment Services as a recovery advocate, um, which basically was helping people get acclimated and acquainted when they'd come into treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and that company took a big risk. I mean, I had only had, a, like I said, four months of sobriety, but basically with Drew and, you know, Mike Netherton, he was the president and CEO. He basically was the president of Betty Ford for 25 years. So I had him as a mentor I had Paul Alexander and they took me under their wing and they basically said, look, like we're going to kind of, we love your energy. We love your, your passion, especially people are going to know your history. So yeah. when they come in, you'll be able to connect with them. And that ended up just dominoing. And I ended up becoming a recovery advocate, started that whole recovery advocate program, had people working for me, created a activities program, ended up taking over the whole alumni program and then went up into branding and marketing and, uh, and then just kept going. And it was something that I loved. So, I mean, I worked in the trenches and, and developed a career in that space. You know, I was doing 80, 90 hours a week uh, and, and I loved it. And that was the thing that's what really attributed to my success and, and, and sobriety was finding something that I was, I loved and that I, you know, I could wake up and get passionate and motivated about. And But what is it about you that you loved? Because you would think coming out of that, you'd be like, okay, I'm so sick of rehab. Like, just get me as far away from this as possible. What did you love about it? I love seeing when somebody comes in completely destroyed and they turn their life completely around. There is nothing more gratifying, no amount of money, no amount of drugs, no sex. I mean, you name it. I mean, for me personally, it's seeing somebody that his life is completely in shambles and you're a part, they do the work, but you're a part of that process of helping them uh, reestablish a life. And you know, again, as you're dealing with people that are dads, that are moms, that are, you know, sisters, aunts, uncles. And I mean, mm -hmm. you're not only impacting that individual, but the, the most satisfying thing is still to this day from the people, all the people I've worked with, is on Christmas, on Thanksgiving, on major holidays, you, I get texts like, hey, I just want to let you know, Connor's still doing well. Thank you so much for, you know, being a part of this. Like, it's, it's, they did the work. And again, I'm not taking kudos for that. But there's, there's nothing greater than that, yeah. you know, and know that you really made an impact. Like there, that's where it's, it's really at is knowing that there's lives that you've changed. And, and again, it's, it's handing off what was given so freely to me, to another person. And then hopefully they're going to impact people and it creates this domino effect. Yeah. But the flip side of that is you also probably work with people that end up passing away or end up not making it. And, and yeah. so you've got to allow yourself to be vulnerable to that hurt. You do. And again, it's, it's, for, it's funny that you say that because I wouldn't have, you wouldn't think with all the stuff that I'd gone through and all those experiences that I'd want to go right back into that space. But I mean, it's also a, such a big heart. And I ended up working myself so much in that space, almost like working myself to death because I ended up relapsing. I ended up having all these other things that ended up happening because I did not set good boundaries with yeah. what I was doing. And it, was, it took years, you know, I mean, I, I ended up have, acquiring a very amazing life. I ended up getting, finding my beautiful wife, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and life was really, really on, on the up and up. But uh, again, as also, I, I self-sabotaged that because I had no boundaries and I ended up, uh, basically burning myself, burning the candles at both ends yeah. and uh, um, came back to, so there's a, that's a, again, a whole nother story, but I got to the place where I was completely burnt out. And today I don't work in the space like that anymore because of what ended up happening to me. Mm -hmm. um, I work at a much higher level, like where I just, I'm not nearly engaged on the day to day because I know my limits. I can't, when I'm in that, I can't say no to people that are needing the help like mm -hmm. that. So I've had to put up, you know, yeah. barriers for, for me to be able to have as like stoppers Right. Uh, so I don't get back to that, that place because relapse is not an option for me. Yeah, yeah, I like that. It's not an option. Yeah. So in uh, there was a documentary that was released in 2012 called Behind the Orange Curtain. You know, I, I know. I think I was in that, like a little, like a tiny piece of it. Were you? I, never, I, I think I was. Uh, like they used a clip from one of the shows, but I never, oh, I never saw it. Yeah, never, never saw, saw it. it. Well, it chronicled basically the addiction. Uh, rates of Orange County. I mean, it focused on Orange County and how there's so many kids that are uh, have wealth and lack of parenting. Maybe two, both parents work and they've got, you know, pills in the cupboard and they've got money around and that this was really contributing to the, um, the epidemic of, of abuse. 
Um, do you think that the area that you grew up in had had an impact in that? Again, I mean, growing growing up, and I, I mean, having friends all over. I mean, the state and traveling and doing different stuff. I mean, just for sports. I mean, it was no different here than it was you know, somewhere else. I mean, I, I, again, is it's hearing what I've heard now. And I know that there's even this, uh, this, cause that was in 2012, right? Yeah. In 2005, it was, I mean, it was, there was very few people in school that were doing Coke that were, I mean, heroin was very, 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 very rare. Um, I mean, and then you'd, you know, you'd hear other communities and stuff that were doing the same, if not more. Well, um, but my kids who are, you know, maybe six or eight years younger than you, it was not rare. I mean, right. they had See, a lot of friends that were doing heroin. They had a lot of friends that were on Xanax. They had a lot of friends. And I, I thought it was funny because I'm over here picking Laguna Beach thinking, what bad things could happen to this beautiful town? Right. Um, and it ended up being one of the highest drug schools. Uh, it's so cool. No, it's, and again, it's, I'm not, I'm not uh, yeah. disagreeing with you. That is something that is, I know for a fact is very true, especially we've worked with the, the president of Corona Mar, uh, not the president, but the principal of Corona de Mar, uh, he's no longer there anymore, but he actually works in the, the space of raising awareness on substance abuse and stuff. And just the schools down here, it was crazy to see that flip. And I think the accessibility uh, and, you know, just having those resources obviously made it a lot easier and more accessible. Yeah, yeah. Well, OxyContin wasn't around during your day. So it that's wasn't. probably what was a big game changer. We, we literally missed it, like, by a couple of years. So we have something that we do called Big Questions. Okay, we're like gonna get, we're questions. gonna dive deep and hit me with a big question. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start easy on you. Okay. Give, give me an idea of what are your daily routines. So my daily routines. So I wake up. I do a morning meditation. I do a prayer, and then I do a gratitude list of three things I'm grateful for. Not only what I'm grateful for, but why. That's where the real meat of it. It comes in is is identifying the why you're grateful for. So, are you doing this while you're still in bed, or how quickly in the morning do you do it? I, I allocate about thirty minutes to this, so I get up, and within about five minutes, I'm I'm pretty much okay. to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to put I like to put something positive in my head right away. I don't do you like, do it in your bed? Do you go to a different place away from the family, or it's it's? I mean, it's I, I'll do it in bed. I'll get up, make a cup of coffee. Sometimes I'll do it downstairs. I don't really have like a, a ritual Special where place I do or, it. Okay. I know some people do, and it's that's good. But for me, it's more of just kind kind of the, the consistency of doing it and kind of in, in a flow of doing that. Uh, and then I actually send out that gratitude list to about 15, 20 other people uh, and I get one in return from them. So it kind of holds us all accountable and you get to kind of see what people are up, you get to see what people are up to and what they're doing. So uh, it's a nice way to stay in communication with everybody on a vulnerable level. Is that uh, uh, other people who are in... Um with trying to keep sober or is this your family members? No, family, you... friends, uh, Aww, people in the program. I want you to send me the list one morning. I can. I have a bunch of <laughs> I'll people. I'll send that, it back to you. Yeah, yeah I have a, I'm more than happy to. I have a lot of people that are not in recovery that it's just a great way to start the day yeah. and it's something that I've instilled in my life. Even when I was going through my struggles and I had my relapses, it was something that I still try to stay uh, very consistent with uh, and I've done it for years now and I actually get an effect when I don't do it. Like, so I notice if I don't do my prayer, I don't do my meditation, I don't do my gratitude list. It's It's been wired in me to do it. And now when I don't do it, I actually, it affects my day in the negative. And when I do do it, it's, it's always great to start off on the right foot. Uh, and then after that, when, before COVID, I would always go to a meeting. Uh, you know, it's something for me is, is a 12-step meeting. Um, and then I would go to the gym. Now, do you go to the same uh, place every time or do you go to different AA meetings or how do I you do would that? usually go to the same one. I mean, because there's so many meetings out there and there, there's a lot of really good ones. But for me, I, when I find a, a, a couple of meetings that I really like, yeah, I like to stay consistent with, with that. Yeah. But I, I really, you know, for me, is I go to a men's meeting and then I go to a, you know, a, um, an open meeting for, you know, male and female. Um, but, you know, a men's meeting is, is really where I think... Uh, the true, true vulnerability comes in. There's a lot of humility um, and you can connect on that. Um, so, but I, I find, I, but when COVID wasn't happening, I ended up creating our own group. So there was a few of us that would meet three, four times a week, go to the beach, uh, being mindful of COVID. And some mm -hmm. of these guys were, you know, much older, but we'd go on walks. We'd basically start at the pier in Newport and walk down to the wedge and literally walk back. And it was more of like a check-in. We'd you know have coffee and uh, just be, that that is in essence the form of a meeting. I mean, yeah. it's not as structured, but uh, it's do they ever do Zoom meetings? Do they do. I I was a person that needs to be in in, in mm -hmm. connection with somebody. Yeah. I try. I, I'll go to a few of them here and there, but Zoom just doesn't have the same. Everybody uh, has to figure their, their their 
Some benefit. people really benefit from it. And again, it's kudos to them, technology working for them. Um, I like this. Yeah. I'm a much more in-person type of guy. No, I love that. Um, so I, I, I meditate every morning as well. And I, I do do it. I do it in bed. I like try to do it before I pick up my phone, before I grab my coffee or I just try to... But you're so right that on the days that I don't do it, I just feel off. Right. Because I feel like it's my time to not only um, manifest about what I want to achieve that day, but I also do my gratitude, do my, um, you know, I think about all of the blessings that I want to send into the world. And I just, I, I wake up just on a high, like I'm on that frequency where I feel like this day is going to be amazing. And I think back now in the days before I really got into meditation, how you almost become like, you know, you react to your day instead of guiding it. And now I feel like I set my intention about what I want and it's just made my life so much happier and more successful. So right. so happy to hear that you do that. Now, do you think, because you say you meditate and you pray. So how do those two work together? And do you think that they're, they're there's the a same? Conne- there's a connection to No, when I meditate, I, I go for pure silence and I try to clear my head of all thoughts. I focus on my breath. Um, I actually do, you know, four seconds in, pause, hold it for four seconds, four seconds out, mm-hmm. pause, do the same thing. It's kind of, I'll do that for a couple minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and prayer, I mean, my, I mean, I'm a Christian, believe in God, very connected. I have a Bible study that I do on Thursdays. I go to church on Sundays. Uh, but I try to practice. And I mean, prayer is, that's not something I just wake up to. And it's, I, I pray throughout the whole day. Um, I have a, a very good connection with my my higher power, God. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big part of also my turning point. I mean, I grew up in a family, you know, dad was a deacon at the church. And I was baptized in the Jordan River in Israel. Like, I mean, I was oh, always, wow. always a part of this whole process, but I was, I was definitely, uh, wasn't walking the walk. You know, I was claiming that I was a Christian doing those types of things versus actually practicing and getting into the word. And, um, you know, so another thing that I do throughout, throughout the week is, is read the Bible as well. Um, but the prayer thing is for me, it's, it's really, I've developed a relationship with God. Um, it's not, you know, and for me, that's something that's very, it's before I came in here, you know, I said, God, please lead, guide me and direct me and, and let me, you know, Say what I need to say. Hopefully, it connects with somebody today. Um, but it's it's there's no different than me having a conversation with you. I mean, yeah. people may think I'm crazy, but um, you know, it's something that's been very, very beneficial. And I turn my life over because, look, the best of my decision making keeps getting me back to those negative places. And when I've established a relationship with a higher power, core group of people, um, you know, it tends to work out a lot better. Yeah. Is the, do you ever get to a point, or can you perceive of a time when you get to a point where you won't have to worry about? you know, making bad decisions or relapsing? No, it's it's really, it's a daily thing. It's a daily reprieve. It's 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 alcoholism and it's not alcoholism. Um, <laughs> and, oh my God, I love that. You know, and it's uh, it's something that I, I take on each day. You know, yeah. look, when I wake up, and that's the thing is, is drugs and alcohol were my solution. When If it was just as simple as stopping drugs and alcohol, nobody would really struggle. Right. It's what's centered between these two ears. Right. It's, it's my brain. Um, you know, and it's, it's mannerisms, it's behaviors, uh, that come into play. And that's what the problem is. I mean, I had to remove the drugs and alcohol. I had to actively arrest the disease. I had to get stabilized and I had to get into a place where I could focus on what were those really underlying issues. Cause I told you before, you know, I was 13, 14 years old. I had these underlying issues and it was really getting to the core roots of those. And, you know, finding out that I struggled severely with OCD, you know, I mean, to the point where I'd wash my hands till they'd bleed. There was so, there was so many different variations in trauma that I never, I always thought trauma was like you were abused, you were raped, you were molested, like right, you were beat. Right, like right. I never really understood. Like right. I had caused so much trauma, just, I mean, from washing my hands, trying to hide them, having to wear rubber gloves when I was young. Like there's just so many things that I, and that's just one of a million things that I endured uh, on myself, self-inflicted traumas, you know? And I didn't really, I just kind of like, ah, oh, this is just, you know, don't share that with somebody. Yeah. Um, and realize that's that's a lot for a kid to try to process and to try to go through. And so once I was able to kind of go back and uncover all those things and be aware and mindful of my triggering, you know, triggering events for me, um, that's where I'm able to focus on it. And that's why when I finish my day, I literally do a daily reprieve on what what was going on. What could what could I have done better? And in the morning, it's kind of you know I have my calendar and I look at what I want to accomplish today and really stay on task is a big thing that's been really uh, beneficial for for me and somebody that likes to overbook himself is staying on task, but also at the end of the day, 
where, where was I wrong? Did I flip somebody off? You know, and I was to have road rage. Like, how can I really clean my side of the street up right. so it's not building up and um, take ownership and, you know, make amends? You know, I've had to call people multiple times and like, hey, look, I was I was wrong today. I apologize for the way I acted, the way I responded. And it's just being a better person. Yeah. Um, and I mean, do you think, because it's funny because I, I, I remember you, one of the things that I watched on you, with you, you said, you know, I don't know why that happened to me because, you know, I came from a great family and my, you know, it didn't happen to my siblings, like why I went through this. But I, I kind of believe that we come with a mission and I think about how many people you've helped. I mean, thousands of people that have been impacted by not only your personal connection with them, but just hearing about you and hearing your story and seeing what you went through. I mean, maybe that's why you went through that is because God had a plan for you in this lifetime to help people. I firmly... I firmly believe that because I shouldn't be here. Not that, I mean, from the drug abuse, the fights, the car accidents, you know, you have to understand as addiction also, it took me not to the depths of only contemplating, but I tried attempting suicide. And so there's, I mean, there's so many reasons why I should not be here. Uh, and the fact that I am, I am, and it really was able to find a purpose and find a, a connection with that. It, there's definitely it's somebody had a greater purpose for me. It's 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 not on me, and I that's what I feel like. I, that's why I really feel like I'm here because once that once uh, that person wants me to stop doing that work, I think then you know my time will be done. Yeah, well, that's not anytime soon. Yeah. No. <laughs> Tell me something that people would be surprised to know about you. I got eleven toes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh my god! I totally face. went for it. I was like, you should have seen your face. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I'll tell you something a lot of people don't know is that my daughter is the first girl in our family in 40 years. Oh, my sister was the last girl and she's the oldest. I'm the youngest sibling. She's the oldest sibling. All my, uh, my cousins are all boys. My nephews are all obviously, I don't have any nieces. Uh, so she was the first girl in 40 years. Well, and I think you got another one on the way, right? Got a boy coming literally any day. Any day? Any day. Oh my gosh. So exciting. Very excited. That's amazing. Well, I'm so happy for you guys. Thank you. I love your wife, Ashley. And I know her completely separate from you. Yeah. Because she was a hairdresser at the hair salon that I used to go to. And so I used to get to see her there. And she's just so beautiful, so positive, so feminine. What an incredible spirit she has. You could not, you did good job. I I I married above (laughs) my pay grade. She's an incredible woman. And uh, I have, I owe her a lot for the success that I have today. Um, You know, she is, stood by my side through thick and thin. And I am not an easy person to deal with, especially uh, when I am not sober. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for her. Well, and she's had a lot of growing to do too through this experience. She has, yeah. she has. Um, I really re- uh, related to a lot of the things um, on your podcast uh, because growing up as a, a daughter of an alcoholic and drug addict, um, you know, I recognize that you, you can't help but become an enabler because you're trying to make everything right. You just want it to look pretty. You want it to be nice and be perfect. And so you start doing all the things to hide behavior and to patch up behavior and to make it seem like if it's good um, instead of just, you know, drawing your lines and your boundaries. And obviously as a child, I think that's more difficult to do with your parents. But um, I'm so proud of Ashley because she's had to be really vulnerable too and be very authentic and be very real and I see great growth in her too. So congratulations to both of you guys. No, she's, she's done a phenomenal job. Yeah. She, she inspires and motivates me. So who do you go to when you want to hear the truth? Ashley. For sure. Oh, she's going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, Ashley or, or my dad. My dad or Ashley are probably yeah. the two most direct you know, people. Well, and you're lucky because the community of AA is very, very truthful community, right? You can be yes. honest with them and they're going to be honest right back to you yeah. if they think you're if they think you're spinning a line, right? Correct. And that's that's one of the beauties of this. I mean, is is people in recovery and the people that I've met through the program and and just other people that are walking this journey. Um, they're some of the most loving, caring, kind individuals. Uh, it's it's very it's a very big benefit to be a part of it. So one of the questions I asked, and it's kind of an obvious one for you, but tell me something that you used to believe but you don't anymore. Hmm. God, something I used to believe but don't anymore. Um, that's a really good question. And I think uh, I would say 
that money and success dictates your happiness. I don't believe that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because people of your age, um, I think they're sold like, you know, unless you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, you're making hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, they're all like jumping onto this Bitcoin, like, they're thinking that happiness comes from something outside of yourself instead of the idea that it comes from within yourself, that happiness is something I, we create. Yeah, and I think it's just like, it's important. Again, don't get me wrong. I think it's important to have success yeah. and to have achievements and, and to have goals and aspirations. But like, I also have seen, I say we both, mm-hmm. we've been around money. We've, I mean, we've seen how it can, it can also destroy people. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's something that again is, is, is everything comes down to balance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always ask, you know, for me, what life is all about, if I were to summarize it for you in three words, is life is all about the love you have, the memories you create, and the legacy you leave behind. Like, other than that, it's... Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, as your legacy can be whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be a legacy of leaving some empire behind. You know what I mean? It could just be being the best coach to your kid's baseball team. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be, it could be whatever it may, it, that is. And my grandfather, who I was the patriarch of our family, very, very, very successful. Um, you know, those last words for me were those those simple things. And uh took him 87 years to figure that out. Wow. Well, you're on a faster course, a little faster course. Yeah. Give me tell me about a goal that you've yet to reach. Goal that I've you've lived yet. a lot of years in your young years. Yeah, I have lived a lot of years. Uh God. What do you see yourself doing in 10 years? You know, I'll tell you a goal that my goal this is this is really where it comes at is is I I want to sustain sobriety. I mean, a goal is to maintain be be sober, but I want to be the best father that I can be to my kids. Uh, I want to be the best husband I can to my wife, uh, and I just want to continue pursuing to be a, a good friend, just a genuine, good, authentic person. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, you know, I, that's, I, I want to, I like to keep things real and I like to keep things uh, simple. Uh, and those are some of the most important things to me. Mm-hmm. You know, coming out of this 20, I call it the 2020 experience. Um, we all had a lot of like kind of aha moments, right? Things that we realized were not that as important that we were doing and things that we realized that were much more important. Did you, did you come out of that with any uh, wake up ideas or silver linings or... Yeah, I did. Uh, I really found out that time is the most precious and valuable thing that you have. Um, you know, I, I really realized I was surrounding myself with a lot of people prior to the pandemic, which uh, Forbes came out with a great article and it's called Askholes, A-S-K-H-O-L-E-S. <laughs> uh, and it's how can I take 45 minutes of your time to benefit my life? And I surrounded myself with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, people that just suck your energy. And um I really made it a point with my mentor. Uh, I actually ended up uh, creating a diagram, which is basically, it looks like a donut. It's in the center is your family and then write a circle around it. And you cre- you put, it almost looks like the solar system. You put these little bubbles around the thing and it's who's your inner circle. And I identified who my top six people in my life are. And I was grateful to even have six, but then I even had another ring around that. And it was like kind of the people that will go in and out of my life, but who are those people? And basically if they're not in that circle and they're not in that that frame, like you don't necessarily need to be spending time with them. And you can reevaluate it, you know, yeah. often, but it gave me a better perspective of, of like, I don't need to keep adding more people. I'm trying to mitigate, you know, yeah. having so many, because your time is, is so precious, especially when you have family and the kids and um, you have to be selective. And for me, as I really want to have really deep, genuine relationships, I don't care to have a thousand acquaintances. I want to have really, really, really true, authentic relationships. What's important to you and a friend? Trust. Mm-hmm. Simply. I've had a lot of people screw me over in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, dishonesty and uh, trust. I mean, let me say that again. Uh, dishonesty is just is something that uh, I, can't, I can't be around. Um, it's, it's hurt me too bad in the past. Well, we all hope to find people that are trustworthy. Although I've been surprised, my last two guests have both made comments that the thing that they don't see or have changed their perspective on is um, they think that people are not as honest as they used to believe, which is kind of a sad, sad state, right? That we we go into it thinking that people are more honest, and then coming out of it and finding that people are not. I also have I, I have a thought about that that has a lot to do with our boundaries, though. Mm-hmm. 
um, and that the more firm we can be with our boundaries, the less we allow people to think that they can take advantage of us or not be truthful with us. I love it. Yeah, very true. So I think it starts at home. I, I do believe that I go into every situation expecting people to be honest and expecting that people are going to be good. And I'd say most of the time that happens, but um, you know, you also have to kind of protect yourself in case uh, there's you find out otherwise that you're not completely making yourself vulnerable. But I always try yeah. to leave with a place of trust. No, that's. I think it's the biggest thing now is I don't really, I don't hold these high expectations anymore because I, the only thing that does is allow me the opportunity to let myself down. You know, so it's just more of when I connect with, especially new people, it's yeah. just more of get to know them and stuff. And that's where you obviously it takes time to develop a relationship. But, um, you know, obviously when you get into a relationship or a friendship that is, uh, that is, has been a lot, you've taken a lot of time to it. You, you do have expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's building, building blocks. Building, building. So tell me about the Red Songbird Foundation, because this just sounds really exciting. Yes. So um, the Red Songbird Foundation is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, this organization was uh, actually founded by Hillary Roberts, uh, who she asked me to be the co-chair of this organization. And uh, what we are in the process and continuing to do. Now, how did you guys meet? Is she also a recovering person? So she's somebody that is in recovery, but basically... A recovering person, a non-norm. Yeah, she's a non-norm. She's a, she's another person in the program. Okay. Um, but I was basically in this in this process uh, a couple of two three years ago where I was giving away a bunch of scholarships and I partnered up with you know different organizations, different uh, facilities that were doing great work. And I was like, hey, look, man, it'd be amazing if you can you know I'll do some marketing and some promotion for you guys. Mm -hmm. It'd be amazing if we can just donate some scholarships to people and. I ended up getting, you know, close to like eight hundred thousand dollars in scholarships donated, wow. and I was giving these out, and it was it was really cool. And uh, I was invited to uh, Hillary's launch party for the Red Songbird Foundation, and it was also I think it was her twenty second sobriety birthday. Um, and so I was, we had the same PR people, so they invited me to the event, and we ended up talking and connecting. And she was basically the female version of me, and she was basically her foundation was solely around. Uh, uh, women that have been affected by trauma, sexual trauma, abuse. Uh, and again, her being in recovery, we ended up talking. She was giving scholarships away for that. I was giving scholarships away for this. We're like, why don't we join? We're, we're stronger together. Uh, let's join forces in this. And after after connecting and talking, we've we've built up Red Songbird Foundation to the place where you know we've created the most safe and trusted resource to go to if you're ever struggling or seeking guidance for substance abuse, mental health, or trauma. Um, and it's been incredible together collectively. What does the name mean? Red Songbird is, uh, it's Hillary is, is a redhead. Uh, oh. She's a firecracker. Um, and it's actually was, you know, it's affiliated with, she's a, a, a number one billboard charting artist in dance and pop. And um, so it's, it really is, symbolizes Hillary uh, more so than, you know, something that, it, that right. I had to be okay, a part of. Yeah. Um, but it's really cool because it's, it's. Can you sing? You, you do not want to <laughs> No, absolutely. There's not. one thing Jason Waller can't do. I can't sing. I cannot sing, but she can. She's phenomenal at that. And but it, it, for her, it's you know, and the core. She has a whole amazing story. But just like in a nutshell, it's basically she came from nothing and was able. She promised, like if she ever got to a place where she could give back uh, what was so freely given to her, because somebody ended up scholarshiping her to treatment, pay for her trauma treatment. Uh, and now it's been her life's mission to do this. So we basically partnered up. And it's not only do we provide scholarships to individuals that are struggling, but we also create all sorts of resources, seminars, speaking engagements, speaker series, um, you know, having people that a direct hotline that people can go to when they're seeking guidance and direction. Uh, we're not affiliated with any treatment centers, not affiliated with any insurance. So we, it's, we're really separated mm -hmm. as somebody that's a freestanding individual uh, that works with all sorts of uh, therapists, psychologists, doctors, ASAM certified doctors. Uh, to provide the most adequate and uh, um, accurate information around all three of those uh, spaces. So if somebody wanted to apply for one of these scholarships, how would they do that? Just go to redsongbirdfoundation.org or redsongbird.org. You can go to either or they go to the same place. And what, and what do they have to do to qualify? Basically, they have to fill out the application. Uh, and then when they fill out the application, it goes to a clinical team to make sure that they're the proper appropriate fit. So, I mean, we have different things. So there's either scholarships that we're offering out for... Um, you know, a specific scholarship. So if it's a substance abuse scholarship, uh, you have to fill it out. And, and, and when you go through the process of filling it out, if you're struggling with primary mental health, this scholarship is not going to be for you. Mm, okay, right. um, so that's why we have a clinical team on the back end. But when we open it up for scholarships in general, 
Uh, it's a basic mini. It's a mini biopsych social acquiring some basic information, your background, your history, your you know what you've gone through, making sure you don't have the you know you don't want people to have finances to be able to, to come oh, in. Right, and apply. Right, so right. got to cool. make sure that there's it's appropriate and, and that you qualify for for the scholarship. Um, you know, but it, there's there's nobody that's necessarily there's you no know, it's not we turn anybody away. Uh, it's more of just making that sure that you're an appropriate fit for the scholarship that we're offering. Wow, very cool, very, very cool. And now I, I think it was on another podcast or something you discussed about um, helping to uh, like a directory to help people determine what are the treatment centers that are the valid yeah. ones because we've all heard these crazy stories, right, of people going into treatment centers and actually partying harder there than they did on the outside. Yeah. What, so that. one of the biggest things that the foundation is putting together now is is basically like how to vet a treatment center. That's one of the things that we're really fo- focusing on with some of the you know lead researchers in in the space. Again, ASAM certified doctors, psychologists, our own personal truths and experiences, and basically helping people understand treatment does work and recovery is possible. But there's been such a negative connotation in this space. You know, out of the sixteen thousand plus treatment centers, I would only refer to about seven eight percent of them. Um, and so it's basically helping people get properly equipped. Like, what is treatment? What is residential treatment? Yeah, and treatment why do some like? work and some don't? Yeah, why? Well, and and what is what is what is detox? What's what type of doctor should be there? Should a nurse practitioner be looking over my care? Should a, a therapist be? Should I be seeing a therapist? Like, it's giving you all the ins and outs mm-hmm. um, and making sure that you're you know that this is a a medical disease. It is it's it's primary, chronic, progressive, and fatal. You should not have, be in a detox facility having a house tech overlooking you who has no medical expertise or experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's basically getting, giving people the most in-depth and upfront information. It's, again, because it's when you're going into a place like this, you can be easily redirected when you're on Dr. Google going in there and you, you, you go to the highest paid SEO for a person to you know have their ad pop up and you can put on a, a phone call with the used car salesman and they can sell you anything. So it's basically making sure that you're the most equipped. And again, as we're trying to, to, to bring awareness to that, we're trying to let people know that there's do the due diligence. And again, as we're not going to tell you which place to go to, but we're going to help you properly equip. Like I struggle with uh, substance abuse and I struggle with, you know, a uh, co- co-occurring disorder of, of depression. So making sure that you're equipped on what to ask the facilities when you're when you're 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 looking at them. Go and see and feel and touch the place. Talk when you're when you sign into a facility, you're able to go in there and talk to the therapist, talk to some of the, the clients. So it's so it's more of like a guideline. It's a guide. What to it's look giving, for and what to ask correct. for. Okay. Is there like a certification though? I mean, it seems like there should be like a certification. There is. There. I mean, there's JCO accreditations. There's CARF accreditations, and you know it's it. You know they're they're not that they're not that easy to get, but once you do acquire it, there's you know they come in and check on you every you know six months every year. Uh, there's you're not really held to a standard, and you can always hire a third party to come in and make sure all your books and everything's up to speed, and and so you still are in compliance with everything. Uh, so it's very important. Again, is is it, it, you ask somebody like if I were to ask you what is what do you think residential treatment should look like? You know, or, or what type no of quality idea. of care? How often should your your son or daughter see a therapist? How often should they be in groups? How often should you know? What's the accreditation of the case manager? Uh, you know, what is their nutrition? I mean, is there a chef that's over? It, it, there's so many different things that go to it, and again, it's right. based. It's it's so it's so individualized nowadays that it's just very important to get equipped with the proper uh, information when you're going. To Places. It's your life. I mean, yeah. look at it's the leading cause of death in America for fifty year old individuals and younger is substance abuse. Period. I know, and why, it seems like there's so much of it that the process of treatment should be a little bit better managed. But it really seems like the wild, wild west still. Why is that? I why mean, are we look, so far money behind? And gears, you know, is that what it and is? Well, look, I mean, big pharma. I mean, something that I, you know, I say they, they oxycotton. You get hooked on all these different things and. You know, they don't want to kill their patients. So now there's this thing called medically assisted treatment, which is, again, there's a great component of it for about 1% of all addicts, you know, giving people Suboxone and, and different things that they can stay on. But for your average person, you know, it's, it's you don't want to, they didn't want to kill their, their clientele and they're giving all these people these, these drugs. So they basically have a, a, a system where it's medically assisted treatment. And now they're giving them, you know, Suboxone and these other, other opiate-based drugs that are just keeping them, you know, keeping them sedated, but they're not, they're not overdosing. It's a big deal. Yeah. Scary. Um, Sad. So there was a term um, or an acronym, C-A-N. Is that that an organization, Cure Addiction Now? Yes. So that is uh, an organization that I am affiliated with, with Nancy Davis. She uh, started Race to Race MS, um, which is phenomenal. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Uh, This was... 
25, 30 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, basically the doctor said that, you know, we don't know what to do for you. We can't, we're not going to be able to help you with this. Created this organization. Uh, she's a, a very philanthropic, philanthropic woman. Her dad was Marvin Davis. He owned Fox. He owned Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, you know, the little Nell in Aspen. And basically, again, has had all, when she was told that, she had all these resources and connections and uh, basically put together this a phenomenal board of, it's called a center without walls, all these doctors and researchers from all over the country that are basically going to be doing the same work and sharing research as opposed to doing the same work and not sharing research. Right. And uh, in the last 25 years, she's come out with 22 FDA approved medications for multiple sclerosis and pioneered the whole thing. So she's basically stealing and robbing from herself what she did for multiple sclerosis and doing it for addiction. Wow. So she created a template that she can now apply to different... Yeah. So having lead researchers do studies on addiction. Uh, there's just not many papers or, or researches out there uh, around addiction. Uh, it seems like all, all of the white papers for addiction have magically disappeared. Is that true? Hmm. And what do you think is the reason for that? Who's it from? Pharma bottom up. Really? Be my guess. Wow. That's scary stuff, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. So what is... what? How, Let me ask, because I'll bring that back. Yeah. Why do we have the leading cause of death in America for 50-year-old individuals and younger with a steady decline in the amount of success rate and a steady incline of the deaths that we're experiencing? If that was anything else, cancer, I mean, wouldn't you think there'd be all sorts of resources and everything thrown towards it? Yeah. It's kind of, that's, so I mean, it's like, you know, we, there's awareness, people talk about it, but it's like, what's really being done? Um, that's where I think it's, it's kind of like, it's very frustrating. That's why I'm sitting here and, and, and saying what I'm saying around this is because there needs to be way more that needs to be done around this. Right, right, right. Um, I was thinking about it and preparing for this. I've been to a lot of galas. I don't think I've ever been to one that is raising money for addiction. It seems like it's something that is not garnering the type of support that it should be having. Nope, and that's why I'm going to invite you to our galas. <laughs> Yay, yeah, I'd love to yeah. come. We just, and uh, that's something... Again, I just learned how to tie a bow tie. So, right? yes, I, 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 heard <laughs> I might be rocking my song. bow tie. <laughs> hey, we'll take it. But no, it's there needs to be more people getting involved. You yeah. know, there needs to be more people. Again, is you don't have to be in like it's for somebody like such as yourself that knows people that have gone through the process. It's just, it's it's creating the conversation and talking about it and bringing more awareness to it and directing people. So they can get help. Um, you know, there needs to be a movement. We can't do this ourselves. Right. You know, it's that's why we've partnered with people like Can, where we basically take all their research and their information, utilize Red Songbird Foundation to be able to, to you know, as the microphone and 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 the megaphone to be able to to share the research that they've come out with. You know, I'm on the board for the Los Angeles Mission, uh, and and that's a whole other organization where we work with a lot of mental health, substance abuse, the homeless. Uh, it's a, a great organization where you know 150. 6,000 square feet, 13 million annual a year. We foster and serve over uh, 500 people a day, provide over 1,500 wow. meals. Uh, we have a nine month, 12 month, and a you know a 16 month program uh, for people to help reacclimate back into society um, as they've gone through their trials and tribulations. So there's a lot of people that we're partnering with to, to, to create a shift um, and to create a change. And, uh, you know, hopefully we need as many people as we can. We can't do it alone. So you're such you're so knowledgeable on this subject, and I just I love talking to you about it because it's so fascinating to me. And and it, yet you, it's not really something that a lot of people talk about. I know that you are a speaker. But you you um, go to speak for group. What type of groups bring you on as a speaker? What what is your I ideal? I speak at all different all walks of life. I mean, I've spoken at YPO. Mm. Uh, I've spoken at you know multiple high schools, a lot of colleges. Uh, you know different events that are surrounding recovery. Um, you know, at, I've spoken at, uh, um, can't even think right now, uh, like not Fortune 500 company, like businesses, mm -hmm. let me say that again. Uh, <clears throat> so I spoke at like high schools, colleges, uh, I mean, businesses, anything from like YPO. Right. Um, you know, I've spoken at a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put your website information on our website as well. Awesome. So people know how to find you. You have a beautiful website, by the way. Thank Curious you. Curious to that. Appreciate it. Um, it's been so fun talking to you, Jason. Thank you so much for coming on and continued success. Thank I'm rooting you. for you. I'm going to be sending you my little gratitude statements um, and congratulations on the new baby. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me. This is great. I really appreciate good, it. Good, good, good.